Sponsored by Raycon. Hello my beautiful watchers and welcome back to me simping for Neil Gaiman's writing for like the 100th time on this channel. Today I'm going to be talking about the concept of and strengths and weaknesses of his 2001 novel American Gods. This is partly a companion piece to the Lost in Adaptation video I plan next in which I shall compare the book and the TV adaptation and partly it's just another chance for me to waffle about one of my favourite authors. Born and raised in Great Britain, Gaiman was allegedly able to read from the tender age of four and never lost his love for books in the subsequent 57 years. In addition to American Gods, he's famous for writing Stardust, Coraline, the recently adapted Sandman DC comics, and co-writing Good Omens with the late great Sir Terry Pratchett. Those of you who watched my video on Good Omens will remember that Gaiman's emigration from Britain to America in 1992 was the main reason they never finished the planned sequel, so in a way you could say that Good Omens 2 died so American Gods could live. The extremely early moments of inspiration for the novel apparently started coming to him immediately after his arrival in the New World, and eight years later they coalesced into the finished work we shall discuss today. Well, I, I say finished, but there are actually multiple versions of American Gods, because Gaiman, like many other artists, has a bit of trouble resisting the urge to attempt to improve his old work to reflect his increased skill and experience when given the chance. In his own words, a novel is nothing but a long piece of prose with something wrong with it. So, whenever limited or anime anniversary editions came out, he took the opportunity to add, subtract, or rewrite no longer pleasing scenes. I personally read the 10th anniversary editions, so if you notice your experience with this book's plot differs slightly to mine, please refrain from attempting to correct me. Thank you. In the vaguest of terms, the setup of this book is, unbeknownst to humanity, all the gods that have ever been truly believed in really existed and still exist to this day, and it even explains why. A concept that both Gaiman and his BFF Sir Terry often played around with in their writing is the idea that gods are created by worship, not the other way around. Human belief is a tangible power, a magical energy that these beings are born of and shaped by. They assume the image and and the personality that people believe that they have, and the more worship that's directed towards them, the more powerful they become. This is, in a nutshell, the explanation for the traditional old gods, however, they are not the only players in this story, as Gaiman also explores the meaning of worship as a concept, and the idea that any form of extreme devotion or homage could count as a form of worship. Take modern media, for example. A massive part of the first world spends the majority of their lives thinking about it, willingly offering up their money for it, and spending hours upon hours each day sitting before it, consuming its messages, which they will then consciously or subconsciously apply to the way they live their lives. Gaiman is not the first person to notice the fine line between a fandom and a religion, but he takes it one step further by combining it with the before-mentioned idea that worship creates magical beings to personify a belief. So if idols, animal sacrifice, prayers, buildings, and services can cause an immortal being to form and be sustained by it, why wouldn't the power of this alternative form of worship not do the same thing? So in this book there are many, many new gods. There's a god of technology who feeds off the energy we put into chasing the latest gadgets, a god of conspiracy theories who lives on the devotion of the flat earthers and the 9-11 truthers, and even a god of certain illegal drugs who survives on the power created by the desperate need of the addicted. Now you might be wondering what happens to the gods who are just remembered enough to still exist in some way but are no longer worshipped mass, the pagan gods of ancient Greece or the Norse, the druid religions of ancient Europe, if they are powered by worship, what do they do when they have virtually none? Well, amusingly, the answer is they get a day job. They are reduced in power so much they are basically little more than extremely long-lived humans, trapped in corporeal forms with little to no magic powers and able to starve to death like anyone else, so they get jobs that are reminiscent of the roles they played in their former religions. Just as an example, the lead character of the story runs into Anubis, who is working as an undertaker because, you know, death. Other has-been gods do their best to secure worship and sacrifices in other ways, tricking small groups or individuals into acts of devotion to create the belief that they need to continue existing. Making this both more interesting and more complicated is Gaiman's knowledge that, despite how it might appear sometimes, no god in the history of humanity has ever been believed in in exactly the same way everywhere. This is something that comes up quite often on one of my favourite YouTube channels, Overly Sarcastic Productions. We may think that we have a pretty 
pretty clear understanding of the ancient Greek pantheon and the legends and backstories behind each of its gods, but we actually only have a tiny glimpse into one version of a religion that evolved and radically changed multiple times over millennia. Even within the same time period, if you were to go a mere 30 miles down the track to another village, you'd probably notice some pretty extreme differences in their beliefs. Poseidon might be the lord of the seas and the underworld, and Hades just isn't a thing, or Hermes might be the son of Zeus in one place, his brother in another, and his daughter somewhere else. These religious inconsistencies were reduced over time as written traditions took over from oral, and things like speedier travel, mass printing, and long-distance instantaneous communication became available, but even in modern times it doesn't not happen. I mean, I can cite examples without even mentioning the many denominations of Christianity. Certain groups of Christians will believe with their whole hearts that their god is super not okay with homosexuality, while other groups with the exact same religion in the exact same country will strongly believe that their god would never be such a jackass. So within Gaiman's world, is there a single god that's powered by a religion and manages to exist despite all of these contradictory beliefs, or are many individual gods created who go by the exact same name while being subtly different? The short answer is yes. Different aspects of a god exist in different places that they were believed in, who are reasonably autonomous but also exist as a single entity in a metaphysical and not entirely comprehensible by humans way. If you've not read this book and are currently slightly nervous because you're wondering about the Christian God and or his boy Jesus, it is actually a funny story. Gaiman wrote in a scene in which JC shows up for a chat with the lead and has apparently agonized over it ever since, taking it out and putting it back into the story with every new version of the book. In the one I read, it was not in the main plot, but Gaiman included it in an addendum at the end. Gaiman borrows from multiple other religions from all over the world, but as his publication history may suggest, he is a big old Norse mythology nerd first and foremost, so many of the key players of the story are from that pantheon. Spoiler warning, not Thor though, because he is dead by suicide before the book even starts. Tiny side note, please forget any assumptions you might have formed about these myths and legends based on the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I like those films too, but they and the comics they're loosely based on were not in any way interested in historical or theological accuracy. Slightly less tiny side note, aka a, a ramble, I've noticed that those of us who grew up in a predominantly Christian country have real trouble getting it through our heads that other religions don't insist that their head honcho be an all-powerful, predominantly wise and benevolent father figure. In relatively recent times, the average awareness that Zeus was actually a single brain-celled fuckboy asshole has dramatically risen, but it can still catch people off guard to discover that Odin the Allfather was way more of an immature, game-cheating trickster god than a role model. Gamer, of course, does not make this mistake. While the plot of the book is obviously original, and he factored in that they were long past their heyday, it still seems like like he went to extreme pains to make his characters' personalities and behaviours as true to the original myth counterparts as possible, so Odin is a horny, double-dealing, truth-bending old con artist. I usually like to include a good synopsis in my videos to bring those who have not read the book up to speed and jog the memories of them that read it many a year ago, however it's always more difficult to do that with the work of writers as good as Neil Gaiman because while you could make the argument that some scenes go on for a little longer than is strictly necessary, he doesn't add any completely irrelevant fluff to his book that's not worth mentioning at all, so a sensical summary of the plot tends to drag a little bit. All that is just to say, bear with me, okay? The story's protagonist, a gentleman with the unusual designation Shadow Moon, starts the story on the cusp of being released from prison, only to discover that his beloved Laura, the wife who had been waiting for him during his internment, died in a car accident the literal day before his freedom. On the flight back to his home state, he's seated next to a mysterious older gentleman who introduces himself as Mr. Wednesday and offers him a job as a henchman. Shadow declines as he believes that his best friend has a job waiting for him at his gym. Norse mythology fanatics will have already identified this new guy as Odin at this point, as Wednesday started life as Odin's day before thousands of years and changes of languages garbled it somewhat. On a later stretch of the journey, Shadow runs into Mr. Hump Day again in a dive bar, and this time the old geezer doesn't pretend to not know all about him and his life. He informs Shadow that there is no work waiting for him at home, as his best friend died in the same crash that killed his wife. With nothing left to lose, Shadow agrees to work for him, accepting three shots of mead to seal the deal. 
They're joined by a tall Irishman by the name of Mad Sweeney, who provokes Shadow into a fist fight and gives him a gold coin for winning. Shadow starts having weird dreams about animal men telling him that he has to believe in things, and this continues for the entire story. His new boss gives him some time off to go to his wife's funeral, which is even suckier than one might expect because Audrey, his best friend's widow, reveals that her late husband was having a long-term affair with Laura, and in fact it was ill-advised high-speed hanky-panky that led to the accident. On a whim, Shadow leaves the coin that Mad Sweeney gave him in his wife's grave as a final parting gift. Things continue to suck hard for Shadow, this is a recurring theme throughout, so get used to it, as he is temporarily kidnapped by a new god, Techno Boy, who has his minions rough him up to send a message to Wednesday that the new racket in town isn't going to put up with him and whatever he's planning. Wednesday himself is not particularly excited to hear about this. That night in his hotel room, Shadow gets a very unexpected visit from his dead wife. It's not entirely spelled out at first, but apparently the gold coin that he left with her was magical enough to raise her from the grave as an intellectual but still kind of smelly zombie. She admits to the affair and promises to keep an eye on him going forward. Wednesday is once again not particularly excited to hear about the very weird shit going on in Shadow's life. Wednesday then has Shadow drive them to Chicago to recruit someone for this big plan that he's still not bothered to fully explain to his lackey. There they meet Chernobog, a retired cow slaughterer who misses the good old days where they used to kill the poor buggers with a sledgehammer instead of a bolt gun, and his wards the Zorja sisters. I'm, I'm sorry, you guys know I'm very bad at pronouncing things. Chernobog, who is a Slavic deity, doesn't really give a shit about Wednesday or his plan, which is starting to look like a war against the new gods who he believes will attempt to wipe out the old soon, so he only joins the quest after he wages his support in a game of checkers with Shadow. Unfortunately, Shadow wagered letting Chernobog hit him on the head with his sledgehammer, and they both won a game, so after this war is over, if they're both still alive, the old man gets to smash his brains out. That night, Shadow follows one of the sisters up to the roof and hears about the ancient monster that she and her sister's constant visual keeps locked in the stars and receives a blessing from her in the form of what is either a moon, a silver liberty coin, or both. The next day, Mr. Wednesday and Shadow use a two-man con job to rob a bank, and Shadow, without really understanding how, summons a snowstorm by thinking about it really hard. The posse then travels to a seemingly inconsequential tourist trap in the middle of nowhere, where they are joined by an African gentleman by the name of Mr. Nancy. Shadow finally gets undisputable proof that he's wrapped up in some supernatural shit when they ride a carousel and are transported to a Norse long hall where all manner of inhumanly shaped gods are gathered. Odin makes a valiant attempt to convince them that war with the new gods is brewing and they need to unite against them, both as an act of survival and because if they did succeed in destroying the enemy, the belief that had been flowing into them would be available to make the old gods strong again, but he's met with universal unwillingness to risk what existence they have left from the others. After this gathering of gods, Shadow is kidnapped by some shady men in black types who try to interrogate him about the meeting, but are quickly all horribly murdered by Laura, who is still on a quest to use her zombie powers to make up for being a shitty wife. After his escape, one of Odin's ravens tells Shadow that he is now wanted for the murder of these secret agents, so he has to lay low with some old friends of his in Cairo, Illinois. On his way there, another new god, Media, starts contacting him through his TV, taking on the form of several classic actresses to try to tempt him into switching sides. Wednesday's friends turn out to be the Egyptian gods Anubis and Thoth, who run a mortuary and funeral house with Ra and Bast, who have decided to remain an eagle and a cat semi-permanently. After that, Wednesday orders Shadow to continue waiting out the heat in a small town in Wisconsin called Lakeside, where he actually starts to have a reasonably good time, despite nearly freezing to death on his first day, making friends with Chad, the local sheriff, and a kindly old man named Herschel. Herschel. He ends up staying there for several months, during which the book's biggest non-main plot-related sub-story takes place, as Shadow slowly starts to uncover a dark secret about the annual disappearance of young teenagers in the town that's been happening for centuries. However, before this sub-arc can be resolved, Audrey of all people show up and identify Shadow, forcing Chad to take him into custody. While he's in jail, the new gods contact him for a TV and show him a meeting between themselves and Wednesday, in which they violate the flag of truce and assassinate 
assassinate him. Shortly later, Schoenberg and Mr. Nancy bust him out and explain that Odin's cowardly murder has had the opposite effect that the new gods were hoping for and has finally rallied the old gods into mobilizing. Meeting under a more enforceable flag of truce, they retrieve Odin's body and Shadow runs into the new gods' leader. He's understandably shocked on multiple levels, firstly because it's an old cellmate of his, and secondly because his name is Low Key, and now that Shadow is used to every person he meets being a god, he recognizes that for the rather half ass pseudonym for Loki that it is. Supposedly, Loki is just jumping onto the winning team, but more on this later. Norse tradition requires someone to sit vigil for Wednesday, which apparently involves being tied naked to the world tree for nine days. Despite the fact that this will 100% definitely kill him, Shadow insists on doing it himself. While dangling there, he has multiple visions and revelations, including that Wednesday was his biological father, and then he dies because of course he does, he's, he's a human, he's been tied to a tree for a week. Anubis and Thoth turn up to collect him, and he chooses an Oblivion-based afterlife so he can finally stop stressing out over everything. Meanwhile, the old gods and the new are marshalling for an epic battle, though Ra fetches one called Easter, who bounces out to resurrect Shadow somewhat against his will. The plot twists start popping up left and right at this point, as Laura intercepts a man in black who is trying to bring a branch from the world tree to Loki. Loki reveals to her that he plans to use it in a ritual that will dedicate the upcoming battle between gods to Odin, transforming it from a war to a sacrifice of gods to a god, and creating a massive amount of power that would flow into the ghost of Mr. Wednesday, who was secretly behind everything, bringing him back to life and making him jacked as shit power-wise. Laura fatally wounds both herself and Loki, but he manages to complete the ritual anyway. Shadow rocks up on a thunderbird, it, it's a long story, you know, I, I can't mention everything in this book, and uh, he talks to his father's smug ghost. He then foils his daddy's master plan by talking down both sides of the army, which is an impressive, if slightly anticlimactic, way to end the main plot. I mean, I, I had to mention here that edging the most epic battle in all of history and then not delivering is a bit of a dick move, or people would have accused me of playing favourites. Shadow comes across poor Laura and fulfills her request for a true death by taking back his gold coin. He then briefly goes back to Lakeside to resolve the whole children disappearing thing. Spoiler, it was the nice old man all along. Um, it's a lot more interesting than I'm making it sound, trust me. And fortunately for Shadow, Chernobog has grown fond enough of him to only tap him lightly on the head with his hammer, and then in the epilogue he travels to Sweden to meet the OG version of Odin. Sprinkled in amongst all this are little short stories about the different immigrants who brought certain gods to America inside their minds and memories, and therefore trapped an aspect of them in a land in which they would never thrive in the way they did in other nations over the millennia. Apparently Gaiman wrote these as a way of breaking himself out of the writer's block that he occasionally got regarding Shadow and the main plot. And now, a quick word about this video's sponsor. Due to a combination of ADHD and just being a very impatient person in general, unless I am doing something that specifically prohibits me from doing so, I am always listening to an audiobook or podcast, so it's essential for me to have some high-tier earbuds on me at all times. Raycon's Everyday Earbuds have been a figurative lifesaver regarding this. They are the only earbuds I've ever had in my entire life that fit comfortably in my ears, and you get eight hours of continuous playtime with marvelous audio quality for like half the price of the other premium audio brands. I legit just really like these little guys. I like that the case is a portable charger. I like how easily and quickly they pair with my phone. And I like that whether I'm strolling through the green hills of the British Midlands or the sunny streets of LA, when I'm wearing them, no one tries to talk to my introverted ass. These things have like 50,000 five-star reviews, and I am supremely confident that if you follow the link in the video description and get yourself a set with a special 15% off for Dominic Noble fans, there will be a 50,001. TLDR, really solid earbuds, by raycon.com slash Dominic Noble, 15% off. Apparently, while the majority response to this book was overwhelmingly positive, it did have some backlash, and how dare you was a common question presented to Gaiman when this feedback reached him. Sometimes it was in regards to him co-opting real life and sometimes still practicing religions for his fiction. Other times it was pertaining to the sheer gall of an Englishman who dared to write that consumerism or media obsession might be as prevalent a religion in America as Christianity, or sometimes it was just that they agreed with the sentiment but felt he missed the mark and 
music was the true alternative thing worshipped in the States. Regarding his nationality, Gaiman has mentioned that this was a feature, not a bug of his intention. He wanted to write about the parts of America and American culture that the Americans themselves might not be fully aware of or want to acknowledge, a task that is only possible to a relative outsider. And to be fair, it sounds like he really did his homework. He took a road trip across the US along the route that he had planned for Shadow so he could absorb all the Americanness to the extreme and avoid writing about a place he had never been to. Yes, imagine doing that. The music comment I can only find amusing as someone who also puts his opinion and interpretation of things out there for the public to consume. You do get a lot of feedback from people who have trouble realising that their personal experience or headcanon might not be universal. Speaking of my personal opinion, Shadow can be a bit of a hard protagonist to... Well, not to like, I think it's perfectly possible to like him, but I found him a hard person to be in the head of because he's just such an exceptionally sad man. I mean, for good reason, he's had a pretty hard life, he's served hard time, and he loses his wife in the opening chapter, then finds out she was cheating on him. It's not surprising he spends a good deal of the book not really caring if he lives or dies, e.g. being willing to bet a head-splattering death at Checkers and literally crucifying himself on a tree. I should mention, though, he doesn't whine or feel excessively sorry for himself in a way that would make him annoying, he's just... He's just really, really sad all the time, and it can be a bit rough to be along for the ride for that, you know? This book is super fun for anyone with even like a basic pub quiz or casual OSP fan level knowledge of Norse mythology, because you keep having Leonardo DiCaprio meme moments when you recognise who someone is through context clues. The best example being right at the end when Loki makes a reference to killing Shadow with mistletoe, which, combined with the earlier revelation that he's one of Odin's sons, tips you off that our hero has been an incarnation of fucking bulb this whole time. And finally, funny fact, American Gods was supposed to just be a working title, but young Neil just never thought of a better one. Thank you for joining me, my beautiful watchers. Tune in next time to see a breakdown of what elements of this book the TV adaptation stuck to. Don't forget to check out my Patreon page for an ever-increasing amount of exclusive content, and take care of yourselves. Your boy worries. Used to be number one in town, temple attendance on its way down. Who the biggest in the world right now? Techno boy make us look like clowns. Bring me a goat or a pig, sacrifice cause fuck all them kids. Now we start with the worshipping, here comes the part with the unbirthing. Come and join the club, you can't call me Wednesday. I just need to get my fix of piety. American God. Much love and appreciation to my patrons of honor, Shelby Holtz, Atel Spurdloff, and Trace Carter. Shout out to Il Nedge for the credits music, check out his channel for more parody and original songs, and a huge thank you to this video's editor, Sophia Ricciardi, links to her work in the video description. One advantage of being back in Britain for a bit is, you know, decent fucking beer. And before anyone says anything, we, it is chilled. We don't know where you got this warm beer idea from. The Chanel. Not used to working with pants on either. Just my parents' place, so it seemed respectful to wear them. I'm not entirely sure what's going on in my brain right now, but it is fascinating.